A lot of people don't actually know how much of a technical marvel or how ahead of its time this game was. But how ahead of its time was it? Well, shut up, go get a coffee and I'll explain it to you. Now, speaking of coffee... <laughs> Now, speaking of coffee, if you want to go ahead and go above and beyond and support me, you can go ahead and become a coffee member. Link to that is down in the description below. You'll get access to these videos early and you'll get your name at the end of every video. Wow, what an incentive. Fucking shameless. So Jack and Daxter for the PS2 was nothing short of a marvel for its time. I mean truly, the budget for this game was around 14 million dollars and had around 35 people working on this game over a 2-3 to three year time frame. Now for the time, 14 million dollars, I know it doesn't sound like too much now, but for the time back in 2001 when this game was released, that was a pretty sizable budget. It was pretty much up there with some movie budgets like Legally Blonde, GP Creepers, Not Another Team Movie, Joe Dirt, they all had a budget ranging from 10 to 18 million dollars. So for a game to get a budget that's comparable to a movie, it was a pretty big deal back in the day. Now this was also quite new for Naughty Dog at the time because their previous games, namely Crash Bandicoot, only received budgets ranging from 1.7 million for Crash Bandicoot 1, 2 million for the second crash and 2.2 million for the third crash. Safe to say that the money and investment on the line for Jack and Daxter, again sitting at $14 million, was a significant jump in budget to what Naughty Dog were used to. So what did they do with this increased budget? Ah, oh, nothing much. Just created one of the best platforms ever made and got rid of the need for loading screens, had ex-Disney animators working full time on the game, made a revolutionary platformer that had some of the tightest controls, created an incredible world and story that would go on to spawn two exceptional sequels, a racing game, some decent PSP games, and then leaving fans with a giant gaping hole in their heart when nothing new would be added to the franchise after its last game released in 2009 with Lost Frontiers. That's a lot to unpack, but let's start with the then president and also co-founder of Naughty Dog, Jason Rubin, who himself at a very very early stage in the game's development knew just how special this game would be. There was no fear, no trepidations, just pure passion and confidence to bring this new, refreshing and innovative game to the masses. I also think graphically we're going to set a new standard and people are going to want to play in a world that, that's really absolutely beautiful and extremely immersive. And I guarantee word of mouth is going to carry the game. So I, I have no fears. I really have no fears. And that confidence was not misplaced at all. Jack and Daxter would go on to sell 3.6 million copies globally. Just by 2002, simply one year after the game was released, more than 1 million copies were sold in the US alone. It also received a gold prize in Japan for selling over 500,000 units and sits at a moderate 17th position for the highest selling game on the PlayStation 2 console. These numbers by today's standards are very low. You need to understand this is 20 years ago, but back then this was huge. It also received some of the highest review scores on the console as well, with a 9.4 from IGN, a 90 on Metacritic, an 8.8 .8 from GameSpot, a 9.25 from Game Informer, and a 4.5 star rating from GameSpy. Now critical acclaim aside, this game was also a technical marvel. Probably a little too much for its time, and I'll get into that in a second. But what made this game so special? They did a lot of tricks. Um... A lot of expected ones and a lot of unexpected ones. They wanted to get the most out of the PS2. Well, actually, I would argue they did get the most out of the PS2. We had like completely custom tools and completely custom way of using all the hardware. Made stuff back and forth between all the different processors and like did weird stuff on the the old PlayStation One processor you weren't supposed to. And it was just a very complicated design. And look it under the hood. Yes, it was a surprise to see that much code. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, Jack and Daxter was one of the first, if not one of the more prominent games released in the PS2 that didn't actually have loading screens. Yeah, so when we sat down and brainstormed after the close of Crash Team Racing and we're looking at the, the PlayStation uh, 2 hardware, we're like, okay, this world has to be seamless. We don't want any loads. It's got to 
feel immersive and we don't want there to ever be uh, a break from the action or a, a chance for you to say, oh, now's the time for me to put down the controller. I finished that level, you know, and you're just always in the world. It's always on. There's a day and night cycle. So it's, it's always changing and evolving and you really feel like you're part of that world. It's details like these peppered throughout the entire game that also just made it feel like it was well within a league of its own. And as previously mentioned, there were animators who used to work at Disney Animation Studios that worked on Jack and Daxter. So there's no wonder why the animation was such a strong component of this game. The animation of the main characters like Jack and Daxter, uh, John Kim did it all himself and oh my god, it blew my mind. Oh yeah, this, this little space and Jack's cool little waddle, water waddle. <laughs> I love, look at Daxter shivering. That was John Kim touch. Characters were far more expressive than basically anything seen on the PS2 at the time. And small but significant things like animation cycles changing when Jack does something as simple as go into water just added to the overall realism and immersion to this game. What's more impressive than the animations is the length that Naughty Dog needed to go to to get this game to run on the limited hardware of the PS2. You see, back in the day, there was just no way a game as ambitious as Jack and Daxter was gonna run with conventional game development methods on the PlayStation 2. This left Naughty Dog with two options. Number one, they could think outside of the box and get creative and find a way to make it work, or they can pull back on the aspirations. What did they do? Well, they kind of broke the PlayStation 2, in a sense. They made their very own programming language that the entire game basically ran on. It was called Goal, and this stood for Game Oriented Assembly Lisp. Now I've linked an article in the description below if you want to go into the deep dive as to how Goal actually helped Jack and Daxter be able to run on the PlayStation 2, but if you want a quick summary, here it is. So half a million lines of code were written in Goal. Goal allowed code to be compiled, downloaded, and linked without interrupting gameplay. It was all in real time. It also allowed data to be inspected or modified live and had rapid tuning and debugging. But what does all of this mean? Well, it allowed the developers to essentially get around the limiting parameters of the PlayStation 2 and allowed Naughty Dog to achieve a myriad of things. Things like no loading screens, eradicating the appearance of level of detail pop-ins. This is where there is a low res model in the background, but as you get closer to it, the game will swap it out to a higher res version of that model. Now in some games, this swap happens right in front of you, so it can be quite distracting and quite jarring, but in this game, there is actually quite a lot of tricks to hide the camera or hide the models away from you and while that's hidden the models will be swapped out so when the camera pans back you'll have a higher resolution model and it's it just feels seamless it also means that you really get those distracting pop-in textures that you see in other games and on top of all that this software also unified the operation codes across the PlayStation 2's processes instead of the developers being restricted by the PlayStation 2 in a conventional way to make games this new language allowed Naughty Dog to look at the PlayStation 2 and say, nah, you're doing this our way. The PlayStation 2 was literally at the mercy of Naughty Dog. Through this method of game development, Naughty Dog was quite literally able to squeeze every single bit of power out of the PlayStation 2, more so than what anyone had thought possible. Now I am anticipating some comments saying, well, it didn't break the PS2, it's being hyperbolic. This is YouTube, but what I mean when I say it broke the PlayStation 2, it broke what was once thought possible on the console. It broke and elevated the standard for the console. It broke the power limitations and the parameters that were set by the console, obviously keeping in line with the hardware limitations, but it far exceeded anything that was being done at the time. Now, if all of that wasn't enough for you, Naughty Dog were also able to make this game run at 60 frames a second. Granted, it wasn't perfect when there was a lot of eco or just a lot of assets on the screen. It did drop a little bit, but for the most part, it held a pretty stable 60 frames a second. So a quick recap, a 2001 PS2 game was running at 60 frames a second, had dynamic day and night cycles, no loading screens, a new software language written purely for this game that pushed the console past its foreseeable limits, all while giving us the most visually pleasing, satisfying tellings of a young boy oblivious to his impending fate. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is how you make a game. This is how you push the needle forward, and this is how you revolutionize gaming itself. This game quite literally changed the industry, both from a player's perspective and a developer's perspective, to redefine what is or isn't possible and what to expect from games, especially back in 2001, when this became the industry standard. Now releasing in just under two years after the release of the first Jack and Daxter game, Jack 2 would take the entire franchise formula and redirect it or pivot it to a direction that none of us were expecting. Now remember in the previous video I mentioned that the developers created Goal, that unique software language created purely for making the first Jack game. Well, that same language was used to create this game, however, as this was already an established tool from the first game, the developers could simply just jump right in and start making the game. Unlike the first game, on Jack 2 there was no time wasted trying to both develop the game as well as simultaneously create and get used to a new software language. Goal was now familiar and everything was streamlined. So what came as a result of this? Well, everything was a lot more efficient and everyone was familiar with the tools. A much larger emphasis could then be placed on the story and holy shit, what a story this game has. Individual characters and their motives are also fleshed out far beyond what was seen in the first game, as well as a much larger focus on the desolate, dystopian setting of Haven City. Gameplay has also had a massive overhaul where Jack can wield guns now, and there are also vehicles, and there's even time travel, but we'll get into that later. Now one of the biggest changes in this game however applies to Jack himself. From the events of the first game to where we are reunited with him in Jack 2, there's been a couple of years have passed where Jack himself has been captured and it's been experimented on with Dark Eco. As the Baron says, uh, You should at least be dead with all the Dark Eco I pumped into you. But Jack was different. These Dark Eco experiments resulted in the player us being introduced to Dark Jack. So fucking cool. In the game, if you built up enough Dark Eco, you could go ahead and hit a button and Jack would transform into this unhinged, barbaric and monstrous version of himself. Along with this transformation, you also get a whole new subset range of attacks and movements that completely differentiate Dark Jack from the regular Jack. Dark Jack was feral, he was far more agile and animalistic in his movements. He is incredibly strong, but also unpredictable. By comparison to normal Jack with his physical attacks and also guns that we'll get into in a bit, was a lot more controlled and calculated. The duality between the two provided for such a variety of action and gameplay that made the game an absolute joy to play from start to end. This really was the coolest shit growing up because most of the players at the time were also getting into that angsty teen phase, all acting like we had some kind of darkness inside of us. It really just channeled that energy. But that speaks to a more serious point. The target audience of this game was growing up, but instead of keeping with the light-hearted nature of the first game, Naughty Dog took the franchise in a drastically different direction. It's almost like Jack was growing up alongside us. Now if that wasn't enough changes to Jack, he could also finally speak in this game. Voiced by Mark Irwin, Jack had a hardened, edgier side of him revealed. An impatient, irritated and no bullshit demeanor. You look like a reasonably smart man. I want information. Where the hell am I? Eh, uh, sorry. He's new to the whole conversation thing. The Jack and Axe franchise became more mature, serious and grounded. There were warring factions, more devious characters that will backstab you at any chance they got and you really got a sense that your actions had a massive impact on the city around you. But let's break down exactly how Jack 2 took what was built in the first game and revolutionized everything. 
let's start with the combat, the weapons, and the overall gameplay. Holy shit, in this game, Jack has guns. That's right, one of the biggest changes to Jack's combat is that he now wields a gun, on top of having the previous game's combat style of the physical punches returning. So this is Jack's morph gun, and this completely changes and elevates the combat seen in this franchise moving forward. As the name would suggest, this morph gun can morph into different things. You are able to equip certain mods, and those mods will essentially change the style of the gun. So what are the mods? Well, you'll first get a red mod, which changes your morph gun into what's known as a scatter gun. This is your basic shotgun, where it's powerful up close, but not great from afar. You'll soon thereafter get a blaster weapon, which is the yellow mod, and this will basically turn your gun into a long range rifle with a medium rate of fire. Now, one of the main criticisms I have about this game is that those two guns that I just mentioned are given to you fairly early on in the game, but it's a long, long wait in between to get the next two. You can kind of see the thought process behind giving the player a very strong short weapon and a long range weapon, as well as mixing that with your physical attacks as regular Jack, and on top of that, all the attacks that you get with Dark Jack. It gives you a plethora of choice when it comes to combat and making combos, but I would just prefer if those guns and the way that they were given to you is sort of spaced out a bit more evenly. The next gun you'll unlock is the Vulcan Fury, which is the blue mod. This is basically like a minigun that focuses on pushing in as many bullets as possible. But the trade-off is, is that it's less powerful than other guns and it seems to waste more bullets if your accuracy is not top-notch. Lastly, we move to the Peacemaker, which is the dark mod for the morph gun, and it's essentially a released charged electricity ball out to your enemies. If there are other enemies that are close by, they too will also get hit. It is a great long range weapon and it's super strong so it's great for taking out large groups of enemies or even bosses from a distance. So throughout your time playing Jack 2, you'll constantly be swapping between the different guns that are all given their unique strengths in combat, normal Jack's combat skills from Jack 1, the newly added Dark Jack combat that's stronger, faster and more feral, and stringing all of that together to create some of the most buck wild insane combos you've seen in your goddamn life. Jack 1's combat was fantastic, but like most things in Jack 2, it took what came before it and just kicked it into high gear. Alright, so the combat out of the way, let's now get into the city itself and where you'll be spending most of the time in this game. So this game both does and doesn't take place in the same location as the first game. Let me explain. Now you're introduced to the city called Haven City, and it has a large military presence. You'll realize this when you start walking around the city itself. Now, in terms of its location, you don't really quite pick up that it's in the same location as the first Jack game until you start playing through it and you start seeing similar or the same landmarks that were in Jack 1. One example is Samos's hut. Is that... is that... No, it couldn't be. That's not... It's Samos's hut. But what? How? When? Where? Why? We're in the future, Dax. This horrible place is our world. But how is this possible? Well, we'll explain this more in the story section, however, there is a massive time jump of several hundreds of years between Jack 1 and Jack 2. So much so that an entire city was formed between the events of Jack 1 and Jack 2. Evidence pushing to this is Samos' hut, as I said before, so that basically confirms that this is the same area. Now, one of the first things that you'll see when you go around the city as well are the vehicles. You can basically ride anything in this game. Anything that's parked, anything that's already being driven by someone else. Basically, any vehicle in this game is your vehicle. Just the actual vehicle owners don't know that yet. Now, a lot of people claim that GTA had a massive influence on this game, and at the time, Naughty Dog just wanted to introduce players to their version of GTA. Jack with guns and vehicles. I can kind of see the comparison holding validity, but this story was also planned out years ahead of its release, even during the production of Jack 1. GTA may have had an influence at the time, but I wouldn't go as far as to say that this was Naughty Dog's version of GTA, but with Jack, or that there were 
trying to copy GTA entirely. Now on top of those vehicles to get around, you're also given a hoverboard which can be used when you're around areas that have vehicles or when you don't have access to vehicles. It's just another traversal method to get around. It's super fun, there's a lot of challenges around the hoverboard. It's just a great addition. Now looking at this city, it feels alive, it's bustling, it has constant movement and this is what I feel is one of the biggest difference from Jack 2 to Jack 1. In Jack 1 a lot of the locations just have stagnant stale land masses and the only things that are moving are you the player and the enemies. The NPCs or the people that you're speaking to don't really move at all they're just sort of stuck on one square and that's it. In this game, people are walking on foot, they're in their vehicles, they're constantly moving. Now yes, crucial NPCs will stand at their specific locations to activate missions, but the others who fill in the town will go about their day. I'm sure they're just on a very simple animation loop to circle around a particular area, but with the density of NPCs present in the game, it gave Haven City such a different atmosphere to what we're used to. Instead of Jack feeling like he was the most interesting thing on the island back in Jack 1, Jack 2's city felt like it had a huge presence in and of itself. Now like Jack 1, there were also other locations that offshoot from the main central location. Heading down into the sewers, different areas of the city, over to Dead Town or even into the Haven Palace always offered a nice change of scenery to keep the game feeling fresh and never stale. So bigger cities, vehicles, hoverboards, iconic buildings that simultaneously hint to the previous game and also to the wider story being told as you're playing, a constantly moving population that makes the city feel alive, uh, yeah, it's pretty safe to say that the game's setting and locations were wildly revolutionized. Now, I won't get too much into the story because this video is already long enough, but it basically starts right where Jack 1 finishes. Kira is also testing a Rift Rider, which opens up and reveals a new character by the name of Core. Jack then flings the team at Core through the Rift Rider and sends everyone several hundreds of years into the future. Yes, this game introduces time travel and is done in such a good way. You'll hear characters like Samo say at the start of the game, So this is how it happened. And also, Find yourself, Jack! Now these things on their own are quite peculiar, however when combined with the larger story upon completion, it gives players a much wider picture and understanding as to what was going on and what had actually been planned from the start. Now the team does get separated, Jack is experimented on for a few years as I said at the start of the video with Dark Echo which resulted in him turning into Dark Jack and throughout the game you also perform tasks for some pretty devious characters all while Core is hiding in plain sight and is looking for a precursor stone. The twists and turns in this game were simply amazing. Now we're getting into heavy heavy spoilers here so if you haven't already played this game that's 20 years old, <laughs> uh, maybe switch off. Don't you recognize him? The boy is you, Jack. And this place, this is where you began in the future. But how? My mind was blown when I realized that I was playing a young Jack that had already been sent back in time from an older Jack and I'm now playing through the events of that younger Jack growing into the older Jack that sent me back in order to send back another young Jack. This game creates a great time loop and the instant of realization for me as a kid when it clicked for me that I was fulfilling a time loop and fulfilling a wider destiny will forever be one of the most memorable moments in gaming for me. It was so impactful and to this day it blew my mind as to how Naughty Dog were able to put so much thought, wealth and detail into Jack and Daxter's world building and just how much they were able to elevate from the foundations that were set in Jack 1. Now at the game's completion when you send young Jack back you essentially close off that time loop for you so the Jack that you've been playing the one that has already been sent back by an older Jack, you've completed the events of Jack 1 and Jack 2 to send another young Jack back, all of that has been done. So that time loop is closed off for you so you can go on to the events of Jack 3. The Jack that you've been playing has essentially fulfilled the destiny that you needed to do in order to get another young Jack back to fulfill the time loop again. 
confused. Honey, the more you think about it, the more it hurts to head. But with all that being said and done, I hope you can clearly see just how extensive the changes were in bringing Jack 2 to life and how the game completely revolutionized the Jack and Daxter franchise. It improved upon all facets of the game. The characters were way more detailed, their motivations were far more complex. The world building took the franchise to a whole new level while also enhancing the first game with the added time travel elements. Combat traversal, city settings, new abilities were also fantastic additions that again revolutionized the entire Jack and Daxter franchise. Jack 3 releasing only one year and one month after the release of Jack 2, the game that would go on to revolutionize basically everything in the Jack and Daxter franchise from its cities, its locations, combat story, traversal, character interactions, etc. The question that was put to Jack 3 was how can they maintain this momentum? Where do you go from here? How do you improve upon a game that improved the franchise so drastically already? What possible room for improvements were needed to once again take this franchise and go even further beyond? Well, Naughty Dog did what they do best and they took what came before it and elevated the franchise even further. Each installment working on enhancing the foundations of the games that came before it, forever expanding the lore, the characters, the gameplay mechanics, the controls, abilities, weapons to create a cohesive and perfect trilogy spanning over the last three year period. Now a lot has been accomplished across the Jack and Daxter franchise, however, did Jack 3 perfect the trilogy? Let's find out. Now in the previous video I mentioned one of the biggest changes to Jack 2 was its introductions of guns. So how does Jack 3 change this mechanic even further? Well Naughty Dog looked at the 4 guns given to you in Jack 2 and said four! This game gives you a total of 12 guns over the original 4 that were in Jack 2. They go ahead and give you the original 4 and then they give you 2 additional guns per 4 mods. I mean, look at how many guns you are given throughout the space of this game. Some of the additional gun slots just enhance the gun that came before it, others change the gun entirely. It meant that you now had an astonishing level of choice and variety in the gunplay. More choice to the player is always better in my books, and it allowed for more freedom to choose to play how you want, to pick the guns or the lineage of guns that best suit your playstyle, and this is only adding to the extra variety in the game's combat. Now one of the downsides of giving players this many guns is that it can become pretty overpowered, especially when you start pairing up and combining AoE guns and also guns that ricochet bullets and attack all the enemies around you, it just made it very hard for enemies to actually get near you to pose any kind of real threat. This means that any kind of difficulty spikes or difficulty scaling were quickly reduced and the game was a lot easier than what Jack 2 was. Now continuing on with the combat, Jack 2 gave us a contrasting mechanic to the regular Jack in the form of Dark Jack, that incredibly strong, monstrous and aggressive darkness that Jack had unlocked that could deal devastating blows. But how did Jack 3 improve on this? Well, Jack 3 was given light powers, otherwise known as Light Jack. It was a gift from the precursors and Jack was given these light powers to balance out the darkness within him and with these new abilities came even more mechanics that the player could take advantage of. Dark Jack was seen as more of a destructive suite of moves and abilities, so conversely Light Jack was seen as more of a restorative feature to the game. You could slow down time, he could fly, he could even self heal and create a light shield around him. So for those of you playing at home, let's do a quick recap as to the abilities and options available to you in a combat setting now with the introduction of Jack 3. So you still have the same physical simple combat found in Jack 1, you have the guns from Jack 2 and also Dark Jack that was introduced in Jack 2, as well as each of those guns introduced in Jack 2 now having more slots, so you go on from 4 guns up to 12 guns, and then on top of that you now have the alter ego to Dark Jack in the form of Light Jack. 
looking back at Jack 1 and seeing what you started with versus what is available to you in Jack 3 is nothing short of amazing. There is so much choice and availability for a player to play how they want in the style that they want in these games. It really just shows that the scaling and leveling and improvements across the entire franchise. But wait! Jack 3 also perfected vehicles and racing. In Jack 2, there were a few racing sequences and a plenty of vehicles around Haven City. It was clear that Naughty Dog had an affinity to vehicles and racing to a degree and were passionate enough to inject some of that into Jack 2, but Jack 3, oh my god, Jack 3 gave us buggies. Now these buggies were rugged vehicles that you would use to traverse large distances within the wasteland. More on the wasteland in a minute. However, these buggies had their own weaponry and all of the buggies had their own unique individual stats when it came to speed, durability and jump heights. Now some were super heavy so they were really slow, they had limited jump heights yet they were super sturdy and had super high defense stats. They were basically tanks. Others were more agile, they were lighter, quicker, with faster speeds and huge jump heights, but the trade-off was that you were so much more vulnerable to attacks. Now throughout the game, Jack unlocks around 8 of these buggies and you get to pick which one you want to take out whenever you enter the wasteland. Now control stats aside, each vehicle had its own style of weaponry as well, just adding to the game's feature of giving you the player as many options as possible across all of its facets. Some buggies had machine guns, others had grenade launchers, others had dual submachine guns, and some don't even have weapons at all. It was up to you to look at the mission and assess at every single time you went out which buggy would be most suitable for your needs, as well as which buggy personally favours your playstyle. It made me feel so much more involved in the game and if I died I knew it could be either because the vehicle I picked was unsuitable for the mission at hand or the selected vehicle just didn't fit with me personally. And the racing and the buggies were so praised in fact that it actually spawned off a completely dedicated racing game called Jack X. Now let's get into the locations you'll be visiting in this game. A lot of them return from Jack 2. Now I think it could be one of two mindsets here. Either one, if it ain't broke don't fix it, or two, they just wanted to reuse the similar locations because they already had all the assets and allowing them to push out this game in such a quick time frame. It would explain how they were able to push out an entire sequel in just one year and one month after Jack 2's release. Reusing older locations seen in Jack 2 did allow them to completely focus on the newer locations like the Wastelands or even Spargus, both of which offer up a wealth and variety of both visual interests, introductions to interesting characters, and both play a large role in progressing the overarching story forward. Now speaking of story, does this story of Jack 3 tie up the trilogy very very neatly? No, it doesn't. Unfortunately, this is probably one of the weakest parts of this game, and unfortunately, spoilers ahead, is the reason why I don't think that Jack 3 perfects the Jack and Daxter trilogy. Now, coming off Jack 2's story, where it was super, super complex, but executed perfectly with the time travel, the time loops, and those revelations that you would see as you play, by comparison, Jack 3's story is a lot more simplistic, however the execution is very very messy. Here's what I mean, Jack has been exiled from Haven City and banished to the wasteland. Now at the end of Jack 2, Jack is seen as the hero of the city, he saved the city, he saved the world and he's deemed as the heir to the city. Most people can agree that he was a hero, but in this game for some reason he's banished to the wastelands from his actions in Jack 2. Like, how does that make sense? Vega, who is a new character that's introduced in this game, who is kind of like a high councilman or a politician type in Haven City, personally saw to Jack's exile from Haven City for his quote unquote heinous crimes, despite all the good that he did in Jack 2, and it was later found out that Vega had a prejudice to Jack's dark eco ability, even referring to him as a dark eco freak. Are you sure you want this dark ego freak contaminating the hallowed halls of our glorious precursors? 
Now, in my mind, if someone as important as Vega has such a big power and presence in the Jack and Daxter world, surely he would be mentioned or at least hinted to in the second Jack game, right? No, this character is completely shoehorned into this game as a means to get Jack out into the wasteland. It is a shocking way, an absolute horrible way to get Jack to where you want him to be in the story. There was just no thinking behind this. It was a massive loophole. Now, we'll be discussing Vega more later in the video, but his introduction was just weak. Anyways, Jack, Daxter, and Pekka are exiled to the desert or the wastelands where desert dwellers pick them up and take them to a new location called Spargus. Now, Jack then meets the king of Spargus, Damos, and you'll find out that he has kind of a relation to Jack later on in the game. But Damos does say that because we saved you from dying in the wasteland, your life now belongs to us. So Jack goes out and does all these missions for Spargus, trying to prove himself, trying to work off the debt of the life that is now owed to the Wastelands or King Spargus himself. Now this is where it gets really dumb. So Errol returns from Jack 2 and he is, <laughs> I could not stand him in Jack 2. He was the biggest prick. I could not stand him at all. But he's returning in Jack 3, but he's not the same Errol. He's Metal Errol. He's uh, Errol, Cyber Errol made completely of metal. And his personality is just as shitty as, the, as Jack 2, but just on steroids. He's hellbent at getting rid of all of Light Eco and he's hellbent at besting Jack, again, and he's also obsessed with destroying the world to, I don't know, possibly prove to himself that he's capable? Now this really made no sense to me because he's not that compelling of a character in Jack 2, not that likeable, and then you bring him into this game where he's obsessed with taking down Jack and destroying the world, and I'm thinking, buddy, who are you proving yourself to if you go ahead and destroy the world Everyone that would recognize that you did that would be fucking dead. What are you thinking? I found some new friends to help me conquer this puny little planet. You're talking to the Dark Makers. It seems my digital self can communicate with these poor, tortured minds quite well. Oh, they're just like you and me, Jack. Well, me at least. They want a home, someone to call a friend. Destruction of all my ego! They volunteer to help me put this puny planet out of its misery. But then you find out he's working with the Dark Makers. Who are the Dark Makers? Well, they're precursors who have been influenced and corrupted by Dark Ego. The Dark Makers were once precursors, but their exposure to Dark Ego changed them. They began twisting worlds, conquering life, and dark ages ensued. Now the Dark Ones have found your world and are coming to claim it for themselves. Pretty cool, right? These precursors who have been talked about across the three games, these godlike beings, they're corrupted. You would have thought that maybe these Dark Makers would have been mentioned in either of the two games as a possibility for precursors to go to the dark side, right? No, they've never been introduced at all. Anyway, it's been revealed that this purple star in the sky is actually the Dark Maker's spaceship, and they essentially want to also destroy the world or terraform it. Again, it's just another world ending threat. It's just really not that interesting at all. These faceless monsters destroying the planet. It, it's such a weak story, especially compared to what we got in the previous Jack game. Now, we do have a couple of battles with Cyber Errol, and after a few battles, Jack eventually does kill him, and we go ahead and we kill the spaceship that's holding the Dark Makers on there as well. Now, Jack and Daxter eventually trigger a planetary defense system. The Dark Maker ship is yeeted and all is well. Now, because Jack was such a hero, proving himself again, saving the world again, he was offered the powers of a precursor. Pretty big deal, right? That's huge. <sighs> When he was offered the power of the Precursors, Vega, that high-ranking councilman that we talked about before, jumped into the light to steal the power of the Precursor from Jack. But what happened? Did he turn into this godlike Precursor? No, he turned into a fucking Otzel. You have proven your worth, warrior. We grant you the gift of evolution. 
the honor of becoming one of us. Step aside! I will be the one who evolves into a Prakasa. The right is mine! Be careful what you wish for. It is done. One minute, 37 seconds later. These creatures are the great Prakasas? And I wanted to evolve into them. No! A little drafty, isn't it? <laughs> it is then revealed that the precursors for the entire run of this game have always been Otzels. What the fuck? We are unhappy with your performance. If you had been a true hero, you would have stopped Errol by now. Oh my god. Yes, well, uh, now we are even more angry. And uh, we order you to avert your eyes, or we will learn. Oh, Baba. They look like me? Not what you expected. Yeah, we like get that a lot. Don't look so upset. If you knew we precursors were a bunch of little fuzzy rats, would you worship us? Could we run the universe? Not possible, buddy. This absolutely infuriated me when I found this out in this game. This whole thing of precursors being these godlike creatures, just, just far beyond any of our comprehension, but just Otzels talking themselves up. It's this whole Wizard of Oz thing, like, you know, pull behind the blinds and they just end up being some fucking Otzel. It was so, so dumb and completely ruined the image that was being built up for these precursors. And it really just showed that this game had been rushed out and they couldn't commit to a really good storyline. So they just went with a gag storyline. And also on top of that, had Jack actually gone into the light, he would have been turned into an Otzel. What kind of ending are we talking about here, guys? The story was fun to play through, and you do learn a lot about Jack's father, and also Ma, who was the creator and founder of Haven City. It also led to many fans to speculate who Ma really is, with some speculating that Jack himself is the younger version of Ma. However, as there is no Jack 4, that story was never expanded on. Now some do say that he is a descendant of Ma, others say that because some characters in the game call him Jack the Ma, he must be Ma himself. And you can call me by my first name, by what my father called me, Mar. Wait, Jack is Mar? The Mar? Now I think this story didn't really resonate with me too much, or at least not as much as number two did, because planet destroying aliens really aren't that interesting. Time travel in Jack 2 blew my mind, and I feel like if there was a Jack 4, they could really delve into the origins and adventures of Jack and his relation to Ma, which was raised in Jack 3, but this was all left open. A lot of questions raised in Jack 3 were left unanswered, and any setup was never paid off, which I feel may have dampened my experience with the game overall. So did Jack 3 perfect the trilogy? Unfortunately, with all of its additions and building upon the previous two games with all its different abilities and mechanics, I'd have to say that it didn't perfect the trilogy. I'd even go as far as to say that it actually left it in a worse off position from where Jack 2 elevated the franchise to. The scope of the franchise with the introduction of the revolutionary gameplay and innovative technology in Jack and Daxter 1 to the drastic pivot in the more mature, feral and grounded take in Jack 2 to the many additions in Jack 3, Naughty Dog were able to accomplish something truly amazing. They made one of the most impactful, significant and timeless tales to ever grace the PlayStation 2. We grew up with Jack and we changed alongside him, however the rushed, non sensical storytelling of Jack 3, along with important characters that were apparently not important enough to ever mention in previous games beforehand, left Jack 3 feeling overly rushed and just inferior to Jack 2. And the feeling of being rushed is justified, especially as I said before, this game released only one year and one month after the release of Jack 2. That turnaround time is absolutely insane and something had to be compromised. 
Unfortunately, in this case, it was the story. Now, the Jack and Daxter franchise is not perfect by any means, but I hope that this little three-part series showed you just how and why these games were so special to me and why they held such a significance to millions of players across the globe. But guys, that is the end of the video and the series. Let me know in the comments down below. What is your favorite Jack game out of the trilogy or even the offshoots? If you liked the video, please go ahead, leave it a like, subscribe to the channel, and also let me know in the comments down below what other game series do you want me to look at next. If you like the entire series, please go ahead and share it with someone as it definitely helps out the channel and the algorithm. But take care, stay safe out there, guys, and I'll catch you in the next one. My life's work, it turns out was spent searching for a bunch of furballs.